Hi, Matt. I'm Sarah from The Upcoming. Such a pleasure to be able to speak to you. How are you doing today? Okay. Good. How are you, Sarah? I'm great. Thank you. Um, so I actually watched the film back at the London Film Festival when it was showing, but I have re-watched it to refresh my memory. But all I remember is coming out of the cinema feeling really moved by it. Um, but maybe you could just kick off, you know, tell us a bit about the genesis, genesis of the film because it's gone on quite an unusual journey. It started off as one thing, became another, and sort of uh, the, the stories of, of both your own personal history and of your co-star Sheldon kind of melded together. Um, so maybe you can just tell us a bit about how it all came to be. Yeah, yeah. Thank you um, so much for watching it. Not once, but twice also. Um, it started in 2018. I started writing this script about uh, loosely based on a few events in my own life. And I had this guy in mind who I had gone on a date with back in 2015. And his name is Sheldon D. Brown. And he and I had gone on a similar date to the one in the film. I sent him the script. He lives in Chicago. I live in New York, which is about a 10 hour drive, so not close. And I said, if you're in New York this summer, I think you'd be really great for this part. Um, now, I had never seen him act before, but I knew he could sing because he would do these great videos on, on Instagram. And I would quietly watch them and be like, oh my God, this guy's amazing. Um, anyway, I sent him that script and he texted back, hey, I'm actually in New York right now. And we met up across from the stoop. We first met and grabbed drinks and out of, um, you know, paper bags. And we didn't talk about the script at all. <laughs> and I think it was two weeks later, he said yes. And he started working on, you know, a few scenes saying like, I think this would, would be better. This would be better, blah, blah, blah. And then I got the text two months to the day, um, almost to the day in April, that he was in the hospital and he, spoiler alert, as people, have they seen the film? I don't know, but it doesn't matter, just carry on, that's fine. Okay, so um, he had been shot in a drive-by shooting and we didn't know if he was gonna be okay. And I really never had anybody else in mind for this character. Um, I didn't want to make this film. Um, we just waited and, and held our breath to see if he was going to be okay. And I saw that film by Chloe Zhao, um, the writer with my DP. And I remember coming out of the theater completely changed, not knowing that cinema could do something like that, really towing the line between narrative and doc and bringing in these characters, you know, playing versions of themselves. And I thought, well, you know, if Sheldon is healthy enough to do this at some point, um, he's going to have this huge scar. He's, he has a colostomy bag. Um, you know, we have to incorporate this in some way. And I remember when he got out of surgery and he was um, like making jokes and back to his old self, he, he said yes, and he decided to bring this into um, the fold. So the film had always been about trauma and now it became this film about healing at the wounded place. And these two guys needing to work through their own past in order to be present with each other. Yeah. And one of the things that's very striking about the film is that it, it just feels so real. Like we feel like we're so uh, you know, close to the characters, there's so many intimate moments. Um, it almost doesn't feel scripted. Um, so how did you achieve that? And how do you kind of walk that line between sort of fiction and reality, especially when you're perhaps acting out some of your own experiences and, you know, referring to uh, things that have happened to you? Is That must be quite challenging as well. So, you know, how did you want the film to look and feel and, and how was it for you having such a personal story to tell? Yeah, I wouldn't recommend it to anyone. Um, it was very difficult <laughs> and it's still difficult to talk about because you know you write the script and it's one thing and then you make the film and then you have to edit it and look at yourself and um, relive this story over and over and then you talk about it. Um, and that said, it was, 
deeply cathartic. Um, that is my childhood home. That is my New York apartment. I had roommates living there when we were shooting those scenes. Um, uh, what else? That's the Panera that I came out at. That's a, a, a bread place in the States that you should totally come out to your mom if you're in the States and if you want to come out to your mom. Um, and yeah, it was just a lot of trust and feeling like if I fell, someone was going to catch me. And that came down to my DP, Eric Schleicher, uh, my co-director, Kieran Mulcair, who had gone through something similar. And of course, Sheldon, who was in New York three months after this had happened to him, reliving this moment, um, which like no one else does like the amount of bravery and strength and, and grace that takes is um, just something I had never seen before. Mm. And also just that it feels very rooted in all those locations. And perhaps it is because you have a personal attachment to those and they are the real places that that really comes across. And I was reminded even of, um, you know, Eliza Hitman's Beach Rats, which had a yeah. similar kind of slice of life, slice of life kind of feel to it. Um, so, and you mentioned the rider. Did you take inspiration from any other filmmakers in kind of getting that? And you know, the soundtrack in, in the way the kind of the, the look of the film um, flows. Thank you. Yeah, Eliza Hidman is fantastic. I love her. Um, definitely Robbie Ryan and Andrea Arnold's uh, Fish Tank. Um, anything where they were using natural light and it, and it felt like a documentary, like they were towing this line between narrative and doc that's the space that we wanted to live in. And we had no choice. I mean, we shot this thing for um, 50K. So we didn't have any rigs. We didn't have any stands. We, we didn't have much at all. We were just working with what we had. And yeah, yeah. it's a uh, very cinema verite. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of the issues that the film deals with as well, you know, and on the one hand, it can feel like we're just watching real life play out. But then, of course, there's so many big things happening at the same time. And I wondered what, you know, sort of things you wanted to bring out, for example, the way that trauma can live in the body as well as in the mind as a memory. You know, the way that he's kind of the characters reacting physically um, in kind of unexplained ways. So it's something that's resurging without him even thinking about it. But also how there's a lot of hope in the film and optimism and there's actually a lot of like funny moments, especially with the therapist. So there's that levity as well as kind of digging into the pain. So were those things you just definitely wanted people to take away from watching it? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, I never had therapists growing up. I only had sitcoms and late night TV. So comedy was always a big part of how I got through and I was always the class clown and um, and that was a big part of, it was always a big part of the script. So I'm glad you found that funny. I, you had said something that made me think of, well, I guess I'll just finish because we don't have enough um, time, but I never had any closure with my abuser. So anytime there was a similar story in the news, um, I was hooked. So Jerry Sandusky was one such case. He, he was this high school football coach who ended up abusing a hundred um, some odd children. Um, and that case went on for years and years and years. And during that time, I would vicariously live through these children who, you know, were, were getting some closure or about to get some closure. And also during that time, I thought I was dying. I thought I had MS, I thought I had brain cancer. I thought, um, you know, my hair was falling out because, uh, you know, I had liver disease, the psychosomatic symptoms of, of reliving um, these moments, um, you know, vicariously through these kids was something that I didn't really understand at the time. Anyway, Cicada, the title. Um, if you were on the East Coast that day when he was finally convicted from Virginia all the way up to Maine, you, you heard cicadas. And I remember reading about how only the male cicadas cry out at night. And when Ben is coming out to his mother at the end, you hear that the cicadas start to swell. And I imagine that he is surrounded by all those, those kids who are finally free cheering him on. Um, 
to be open and honest with his mother and yeah so i i know um i think we have a minute left or <laughs> chris is down there yeah so i guess, I guess just the final point to say is that let's hope that there can be more films and you know more accessible ways for people to realize this is such a widespread issue and particularly for men that there mm -hmm. can be hope in and finding catharsis in sharing what's happened to them and you know eventually hopefully justice which maybe you didn't have in your case but other people can if things can be spoken about more freely absolutely yeah and one in three girls and one in five boys um, will be sexually abused before the age of 18 and not enough people talk about that um, male victims are far less likely to come forward so if this film did inspire you in some way um, to you know be a little bit more empathetic with a friend you think might have gone through something. Um, if you want to come out, it's never too late. Even if you're 80 years old watching this film and you want to tell somebody, go tell somebody. Um, I feel a lot better because I did. Yeah. I made so. Well, yeah, I think I'm out of time. It's been such a pleasure to speak to you and, and thank you for thank making you, this really wonderful film.